Hello and welcome to my channel. So today's going to be different. In today's video, I'll be getting you up close and personal. Okay. We'll be talking about me today. I'll be telling you my personal story of rejections with my UK job applications, you know. So unlike what many people think, I didn't have a rosy either. Okay. I also got numerous, unfortunately, emails, you know, before I got to this point that I am in the UK. And so I want to share my own personal story and what I did, how it affected me, and how I got to this point. Is that okay? All right, that's fine. If you're new to this channel, my name is Rajuno. I am a Nigerian sonographer who also works in the UK as a sonographer. And on my channel, I try to provide a lot of insights, tips on how to navigate your way into a successful career as a radiographer or a sonographer in the UK. All right, that's fine. Okay, so I'm going to delve right into this story because I don't want the video to be too long. All right. So, now, so let's start from the top. Yeah. Now, so in my case, I did not come into the UK with a job. I came on a dependent visa. So my husband had the job and I was his dependent. And that's how I came into the UK. However, long before I came into the UK, I had registered with HTPC because I knew I'm going to want to get uh, a radiography job in the UK at some point. So I registered with HTPC. I paid my scrutiny fees and I had been applying for jobs. I kept applying for jobs and I kept getting, unfortunately, unfortunately, they kept, the rejections were piling up. So I kept getting lots and lots of those, but I kept applying. Anyway, so fast forward to, you know, a couple of months down the line, my husband got the job and I came over to the UK. All right. So while in the UK, I kept applying for jobs. So I was applying, I was applying, and then I got a couple of interviews. Now, where it gets tricky is that by the time I came into the UK, I was already seven months pregnant. And so in my application, you know, with the applications that I was doing, my husband had told me that, look, as pregnant as you are, you're very likely not going to get a job. But I said, no, forget that. Soon. I'm going to get a job. So I kept applying. Then when I got the interviews, I would go for the interviews heavily pregnant. <laughs> And my pregnancy, you know, there are some people that when they are six months, they are seven months pregnant, you can barely know that they are pregnant. That's not my situation. My own case, my thumb is very, very big. So you'd see me, I would just be wobbling into the interview venue. And the, you know, the interviewers, usually they would be so shocked to see me because, I mean, they were not expecting to see a pregnant woman. I did not tell them that I was pregnant. Anyway, so I went for these interviews and they were so smiley. Ah, nobody smile, Rachel Yibo. They were so smiley. Oh my God. Oh my God. You're really happy. How far gone are you? You now say, Oh, I'm 28 weeks. And they're like, Oh my God. Is it a boy or a girl? You're like, Oh, it's a girl. Oh, it's a. Oh my God. Congratulations. Okay. So, and then they'll do the interview for you. So, with all that smiling, you'll be thinking, Ah, this, these people are so receptive towards me. Ah, there's no harm. I'm not going to get this job if I do well in the interview. But knowing what I know now, like, like no matter how well I would have done in that interview, they still would not employ you. Because at eight months or seven months pregnant, in the next couple of weeks, you know, in, the, in four to eight weeks, you're going to have your baby. You have to heal from having that baby and then you have to have some level of uh, some period for your maternity leave to take care of your baby now if you're going to be doing all that they need someone to start work immediately so why would they employ you anyway but i still went for the job interviews and i did not get any while i was pregnant okay so it wanted to affect me but then i had an excuse so i could always tell myself oh it's because i'm pregnant that's why i didn't get the job and so you know you kind of handle it in a more positive light and so that's what i did and i went on now fast forward to after i had my baby so my baby was about four months in four to five months and i had resumed application for jobs um because i was ready to go to work i was ready to work and so i carried on applying and then i started getting a few interviews not too much a few here and there so for me that was progress you know at least i'm getting something through the door and it's not complete rejections all the way. So I attended these interviews and I didn't get any at the time, which was, it was really, it was really sad for me that period because I kept beating myself up like, why, why can't I make these interviews? What is it that I'm not doing right? 
I was no longer pregnant, so I did not have pregnancy to blame anymore. So, I mean, I, I literally was asking myself, what are you not doing right? And it was taking a toll on me, you know, but I kept pushing. So what I did was I now, okay, in the town that I was in, there was an NHS trust there. So I went to the NHS trust. I went to the uh, radiology department and it was CT MRI I started with. And I said, oh, um, in cross X-ray, sorry, I started with X-ray. I went to X-ray, I met the x-ray lead and i said oh can i come and you know shadow i've got some free time on my hands now can i come and be doing some shadowing sessions just so that i'm not completely removed from the clinical environment for too long because when you're completely removed for too long it just makes your applications harder and i mean chances of being called for interview also get harder as well because they'll be like you've been out of work for a long time so i went to the x-ray lead and i said can i shadow you you know can I come on certain days and shadow? And they said, oh, oh, that's really nice of you. You know what? Just um, we'll get back to you. We'll get back to you on this, okay? That's fine. Just drop your email, drop your number, and when we're done, we'll get back to you. I said, ah, thank you. I went back. I did not hear anything from them. So I said, okay. I went to um, to the department again. This time around, I went to CT MRI because, I mean, I had CT experience, a little bit of MRI experience, so I knew that, okay, since I'm applying for, you know, cross-sectional jobs, I could also be shadowing there. So I'm not completely removed from cross-sectional as well. So I went to CT MRI um, part of the department and they introduced me then to the assistant uh, superintendent, something like that. And so I spoke to her, the exact same thing. Okay, that's fine. So um, the manager is not on ground currently. I'm in charge now, but I have to run this by her. You know, just drop your number, drop your email, and then we'll get back to you. They didn't get back to me. Uh, I waited and we didn't get back to me. Then I went to ultrasound. Before I came, I was primarily doing ultrasound anyway. So I went to the ultrasound department of the same trust and said, okay, on the days that I'm available, can I at least shadow you guys, you know, same reason so i'm not completely removed from ultrasound entirely i want to you know still be in there and you can put it on your cv as well that you are doing some voluntary work and so that's good the manager said yeah that you know what they are just they are rounding up the rota for february and that you know in march now they'll see if they can slot me in and try to fit me in they didn't do it and she didn't get back to me as well now having lived here for a while I do know that what I could have done back then was to follow up with them at least, you know, three, four times. I think I followed up just once, but I did not follow up again. Maybe I could have followed up more. Maybe they would have given me the chance to come and shadow. But either ways, it was just, I felt so terrible at the time. Nothing seemed to be working. You know, I didn't know I need to follow you up many times. If you say you're going to get back to me, I expect that you'll get back to me, you know but well, they didn't and so I moved on. Now, there was another job uh, interview that I now eventually got and I then, it was a remote interview um, online. And so I prepared, I prepared for this one as in I, I prepared with all my heart and my mind <laughs> for this interview. And then after the interview, you know when you don't do well in an interview. Even now that I've lived here this long, I still say that I did so well in that interview. So if I didn't do well, I'll be very honest about it and acknowledge it. But I did well in that interview. So after the interview, I felt really good about myself, you know, that I'd done very well. I now said, ah, I'm, I'm even the ideal candidate for these people because I don't need sponsorship. I'm here on a dependent visa. So, I mean, I'm ideal for them because they won't have to spend money trying to get, you know, trying to sponsor me. And they don't have to go through the whole visa issues and immigration issues. I'm a very easy candidate for them. And so I was very, very expectant of a positive result. It didn't come. When they wrote back to me uh, the next day, they said, oh, unfortunately, we can't give you the job on this occasion because we're looking for someone who has got UK experience. And that shattered me. It shattered me because you saw on my CV that, or on my application that I don't have UK experience. So why then did you even call me for the interview if that's going to be the reason for, for why you're not going to give me the job? Uh, you know, 
so i was already trying to deal with that uh, bad news basically when i now heard that my colleague another colleague you know of mine applied for the same job the same interview i just finished the same job he applied for it from nigeria so he actually had the interview after or before me on the same day we had the interview but he interviewed from nigeria and i interviewed from the uk and while they sent me rejection email saying i couldn't have it they sent that guy an acceptance email they were going to give the job to him he got the job <laughs> in fact if i was feeling bad before hmm, the feeling deepened it deepened because you know they said oh that they didn't give me because i did not have uk experience and while you're trying to use that one to hold body they now you now hear that ah, somebody all the way in nigeria has gotten the job but the person doesn't have uk experience right so on what grounds are you giving the person the same job and so i began to internalize these things and ah i was i felt bad for a very for a long time in fact i now said i'm not even i'm not applying for jobs again i got i got upset i said i'm not applying for jobs again i'm just going to leave here. i'm going to look for an alternative job in that period and i will carry on like that because the self-doubt was much it, it starts to you start doubting yourself and you start doubting your abilities and you start doubting every i mean you know be telling yourself ah this book where i've been since i know it'd be like i don't know this book or oh. <laughs> anyway so that period was not it was not a pleasant period for me every day i'd wake up almost depressed because i could not understand why i could not get jobs you know and the thing is knowing the things that i know today there's so much i could have done differently back then you know but i didn't do them example is i, I could have written back to them to say you know thank you for your feedback could you please explain a little bit better as to why I could not get the job? You were fully aware that I did not have UK experience. Could you please tell me if there was any other reason why I couldn't get the job? I could have asked for that because that would be valuable feedback and I could have used that, you know, for to help me with other job interviews. And, you know, knowing what I know now, you know, there are some of my interviews where I could have approached, you know, the questions they asked me a little bit differently. You know, I could have done better, you know, example, there was one interview I went for and they asked me, oh, so how many patients do you attend to in a day typically? And that's a very simple question, you know, very simple. So I'm midway through this video. And if you have not subscribed yet, please do. Thank you very much and God bless you. But the way I answered it, I didn't answer it with any form of uh, finesse or pre-thought. I didn't answer it properly. I didn't. So when they asked me, how many patients do you attend to in a day typically? What I said was, um, well, there's no fixed number, any number of patients. As they come, we just attend to them. Um, doesn't matter how they come. When they come, we just fit them in and, and scan them. And she said, you don't have a system where you pre-book these patients before they come. They're not aware. You know, they just turn up. They just show up. I said, yes. That's what it is. Now, that's not the way you answer a question, especially if you're speaking to people who don't understand the system like that. You know, so you can tell the truth, but still say it in a more refined, you know, a more polished and more packaged way you know, that does not put it in a negative light, basically. So a different way that I could have answered that question would have been, um, well, the amount of patients we attend vary from day to day. While some patients are able to book their scans before coming, some of the patients, we do allow some slots where they can come without having to actually book. And as they come, we can actually try to fit them in on available slots and attend to them. So based on this, on a typical day, we can scan up to 25 to 30 patients in a day, depending on how many people show up and some people who would miss their appointments. I have basically said the same thing. I have said, I've, I've spoken the truth, but I've said it in a more packaged way, you know. So just quickly saying, oh, it doesn't matter. Anyhow, they just show up, we just scan them. Your recruiter, your Oibo interviewer does not understand that. They don't understand, you know, how someone would just show up as they like in an outpatient clinic and they'll just be scanned.
but i worked in a private clinic and that is just a difference in territory it doesn't make it bad it's just a difference in territory and what's obtainable in different parts of the world so where i was coming from some of the patients would pre-book while some of them will not and in truth when they come we will check if it is if there's time to fit them in we fit them in if there's no time we won't fit them in so when you're answering a question like that you shouldn't be so brash you know so forward you know without any form of finesse or packaging which is what i did i did that back in the day and that was not good so it's something that i i learned from over the years you should learn from me too <laughs> over the years to know how to answer your questions bearing in mind that the person you're speaking to may or may not understand what you're saying so you have to present it in a way that they understand okay and there was another interview where i did not do enough research about the company so they asked me okay so you do know the trust values can you tell us any other thing that you know about this company and i drew blank because to be honest i only prepared for the clinical questions i prepared for you know i read the trust values yeah i was ready for that and i prepared for all the questions they were asked me based on the job that i was coming for i didn't expect that you ask me any other thing about the hospital so i didn't prepare for that i did not research about the hospital and that shot me in the foot so that was another so i i drew blank at that point i couldn't say too much i mean you know how we do it you try to stumble around but the interview interviewer knows that you don't know what you're saying and that's what happened to me on one occasion so i learned from that as well you should learn from me as well okay so since nothing seemed to be working out for me you know the interviews that i finally got i wasn't getting i wasn't getting successful and i even went to do some voluntary shadowing they wouldn't get back to me they didn't offer me the opportunity to do it it just seemed like nothing was working in my favor so that that drove me to a point where i almost got depressed i was really feeling bad it really got to me and so i i said i was going to pause on my applications i was going to stop applying and i did and i but I, I wanted to still work i needed to still make money because in the uk you you can't live your life hoping to just dwell on one person's salary your entire time it's not healthy and i didn't want to do that so i took one of these uh, minimum wage jobs and hmm, that job was a terrible job <laughs> i mean he gave he gave me some money you know so i had some money from it but it's not one of those things in my past that i like to remember it was a very terrible job the working environment was just terrible you know the fact that you stand for so long like you literally walk for your money every single bit of it and then no form of appreciation you're still being looked down upon hmm. hey i did not if i while i was there i was like is this me you know and then you meet some people there and they'll tell you how oh they've been working here for the past 15 years to 20 years hey how are you able to work here in these terrible conditions for 15 to 20 years and you see it as such a big thing ah i said can never be me this can never be me ah the ajebo in me will i will die i will die if i continue in this place so long story cut i didn't last in that job it was a terrible experience for me but um all of this was born out of my frustration for not being able to land you know um a professional job a radiography or sonography job so with all that treatment and the terrible working conditions in you know in the job that i got i had to resume applying again for jobs so i kept applying and i kept applying now when i was applying looking back now i realized that what i was doing then and why i did not get many interviews during that period was because i kept applying you know like i was being forced to apply and so i didn't take my time to really read the job description or the person specification i'd just apply like that i would just the same supporting information for one job i just put it across all the jobs and i'll just keep applying i wasn't tweaking it i wasn't trying to tailor it or refine it according to you know the particular job i was applying for and so in doing that i did not get many interviews so it was a wrong move on my part which is something that people need to be aware of you don't for every application that you want to apply for try to 
try your best to tailor it to that particular job description and person specification because it shows the employer, you know, the recruiter that you actually took your time to read about this job and you are applying specifically to this job. It shows them that you just, it's not just any company you want to work with or you want to work with them. You know, it kind of personalizes it for them. So you want to do that with your applications. Anyway, eventually I did get one interview I had applied for and I went for the interview. It was in person. I had to do some practical sessions um, and all of those shenanigans and I got the job. So in total, it took me a whole year from when I actually came into the UK to actually finally get the job. A whole year, a whole year of near depression, a whole year of beating myself up. And then I realized that one thing that I did differently from the other applications, you know, was that I had changed my supporting information to fit the job. And um, there was a section in the application where they had asked that we write about how our past experiences reflect the trust values. So I was writing something entirely different, entirely new for this particular job. And it was authentic. It was honest, you know. And so I did that. And now, as far as I know, that made it, you know, stand out differently because all the other applications, they were really generic. And so that was not a very good move on my part. Now, based on my experience, I have learned a lot of things from it, okay? And the first thing that I learned was that you get rejected is not necessarily a reflection of your abilities. Sometimes it is just what they want. A lot of times they just have what they want. It does not mean that you're not okay or you're not good or you're not doing the best that you should do. Sometimes it is just what it is. They just want someone else for something really out of your hands, you know? And then over the years, I've also learned that when you get rejections like that, it's in your best interest for you to write for a feedback. So you write a thank you email. So thank you for your email. And although it's disappointing that I did not get the job at this time, um, I am grateful that you even considered my application. However, could you give me some feedback as to what I did not do right and what I could possibly do better in my next job interview? You know, something like that. And sometimes they are able to give you feedback, but sometimes they won't give you feedback. Either way, it's, it's nice to actually try because if they give you feedback, it could be constructive feedback and you can really use that in your next interview. And sometimes also, if the, you know, the people that they actually given the jobs to actually say no, because that happens, they will start looking back at applicants whom, you know, they could reconsider. And for someone who wrote back asking for a feedback, the chances are they could reconsider you. Because it shows that you are professional, you're mature, and you can handle failure respectfully. So they could consider you again for the job. Every rejection is truly an opportunity to grow and learn. And constructive feedback really helps with that. Yeah. Okay. And another thing that I learned was to never give up on your applications. You have to keep applying. So for as many rejections as you get, you have to double up on your applications because, I mean, if it is your dream to actually move abroad, then you just have to keep at it. I mean, you will get the rejections. I think that's why I'm sharing my story today. So you know that a lot of us here have our own rejection stories. So everyone, not everyone, but most of us have actually received tons and tons and tons of rejections. It took me one whole year after it's not before i'm not counting the time before it took me one whole year after i was in the uk to actually get a job which was very terrible because you think that when you're here it should be easier for you and so in my case it wasn't it felt like it was it would have been easier if i was back in nigeria so anyway in any case just keep applying you keep getting rejections keep applying keep applying keep applying keep applying till one clicks because one will click all you need is one and one will click and after that all the doors will open for you okay so stay positive i wish you all the best in your career and in your job search and in your applications this is my story and i hope that i'm able to inspire somebody out there to not give up to keep at it because something will happen for you and if you're struggling with your supporting information for your radiography or sonography jobs, or you need some handholding for your ultrasound interview preparations, then we have a range of services that you can look at. I will put a link down below and you can see them for yourself and you can get in touch with us if you need any help with this. Okay. Now, 
please don't forget to subscribe subscribe to my channel subscribe like share and um i'll see you in my next video all right bye